Hey, did you enjoy learning more about Canadian movie production financing history and an eclectic director's filmography than necessarily the premise of a not terribly interesting movie because it wasn't terribly interesting last time? Well, this week's movie has pretty girls in cavewoman costume. I can't promise there's not still more to talk about around it than in it, though. Anyway, you know who kind of sucks? Bill Maher. They kind of believe that you're owed a, a, a living as a writer, and you're not. I'm glad the rest of the world is starting to come around on this too, because for a long time it was low-key irritating that so many people seem reluctant to say that this particular dude just didn't have it or was kind of full of shit as a comedian or a political commentator. Well, okay, not everybody. Today's audience watches wrestling, and they are in on the joke. That's not an insult. I that's, take it as an insult, too. I do, too. I mean, when a metal chair cracks your back, that's not fake. You know, that's, there's so never a bruise no, no. on any of you. you Baloney, know, you got a minute? Look at this. <laughs> no. no. Metal hip. Broken wrist. Owen Hart, dead. Why don't you go tell Mrs. Hart what a joke it is, huh? You're saying that Islamophobia is not a real thing. That if you're critical of something... It... Well, it's not a real thing when we do it. Right. <laughs> well, well, no, it no, really no. isn't. I, I'm not, Why are you we so have hostile to, about this it's, it's gross. It's racist. It's, it's not. Terrible. It's But it's so not. It's, so, it's like saying it's those so stateless, not, shifty Jews. You're not listening Absolutely to not. what well, we are saying. You've got to do what. We've killed more Muslims than they've killed no, us by not, an awful lot. We've we invaded need, more Muslims. I'm not from more killed. an awful lot. And yet somehow we're exempted you know, from okay. these things because they're not really a reflection of what we believe in. We did by accident. That's why we invaded Iraq and put four million people. We're not going to... Man, that last one was eight years ago. Ben Affleck is good. He's... he's good. Good guy. Oh, I, I promise this is all relevant, by the way. Yeah, not, not gonna bury the lead as some kind of build-up reveal or whatever. Bill Maher is in today's movie. That's, uh, that, that's the point of all this. Just, you know, establishing some context. Anyway, regarding Maher, it's weird that this specific guy has endured as a thing in political comedy despite having now fully aged into his old man, whining about how the young people won't agree with him, about how correct his opinions have always been, and how cool he still is, Phase. If this spike in trans children is all natural, why is it regional? Either Ohio is shaming them or California is creating them. Like, we're more than 20 years out into the post john Stewart Daily Show, Every Comedian is a Political Comedian era of comedy, and here's a guy who was not a hugely successful stand-up, failed spectacularly to establish himself as a movie star, as we're about to see. I am Yasuhiro Nakasone, former Prime Minister of Japan. Oh, okay, yes, I am sorry. You're the guy who got caught paying off his mistress? She was not a mistress. She was a geisha. Yeah. So the girls up on Oriental Massage on Sunset. In the exact moment in comedy history where pretty much any smarmy white dude who could hit a tight five of observational sarcasm at the Chuckle Hut and had a marginally good L.A. cocaine hookup could land a sitcom pilot, and he's not only still kicking around but treated as a quasi-legit voice in political commentary, and still doing so entirely from clout built off the foundation of having been the guy in the chair on Politically Incorrect, the origin of which was someone at Comedy Central figured out that the McLaughlin group but B-list celebrities and comedians with something to promote instead of politicians and academic to debate the news was a decent unscripted TV pitch, and Bill Maher was the level of topical comedy guy you could get to host that for what basic TV was offering in the 90s. Well, I'm not know, dropping my pants in front of other men, but go ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, how'd you get the job? <laughs> But then the show got popular enough to move to ABC, he said a 9-11 thing and it got cancelled, so everyone had to feel bad for him because if you didn't, you were siding with Fox News or whatever. HBO gave him basically a new version of the same show, but where people could speak uncensored, which was good, but also Marr got to do a lot more monologuing and shout down the guests and the audience when they disagreed with him, which was less good. But, you know, it's HBO and ratings matter less and was one of the shows to get booked on for a good stretch and now we're stuck with this fucking guy. Even as he makes every effort at executing a reverse Jon Stewart and leaping backwards into his his own rabbit hole of becoming everything you once pretended to hate, ignorance and regression. The don't say gay bill, first of all, it doesn't say that in it, doesn't say don't say gay. Parents were not unreasonably concerned that schools had become a place where kids were being exposed to ideas. Like, the fact that he eventually went out and bothered with Barbie, a movie he was definitely gonna hate so he could get in on whining about it, struck me as funny for several reasons, but none so much as the reminder of how one of his earliest attempts at not even a little bit making it as a movie star was actually a cult classic trafficking in exactly the type of politics and social satire of the male ego he now apparently finds so upsetting. It's also, in hindsight, probably the only thing he's done that's really stood the test of time. Cannibal women in the avocado jungle of death.
Wait a sec. What's that I hear? Let's get out of here. What are you nuts? Look at them. They're dangerous. They don't look dangerous. They look lonely. Yeah, okay, so what we pretty much got here is an ultra-cheap, mostly on-purpose parody of the by then, this was 1989 by the way, winding down genre of jungle adventure cannibal exploitation movie, like Cannibal Holocaust, Make Them Die Slowly, Slave of the Cannibal God, etc., framed around a narrative send-up of the Heart of Darkness Apocalypse Now plot infused with tropical satire about late 1980s gender politics, specifically American feminism in the post-Reaganism backlash era. Our setup with the United States supposedly facing a looming avocado shortage, a military unit sent to penetrate the supposedly deadly avocado jungle in San Bernardino, California, have gone missing, likely victims of the Piranha Women, a legendary tribe of cannibal Amazons believed to control the unexplored deepest regions of that jungle. So radical, so militant, so left of center, they, they eat their men. Oh, that. Well, if I like a guy, you should start it. They don't eat their men like that, bunny. Dog tags? Look closely. They're covered with guacamole dip. Believing that a peaceful solution can be achieved, government agents reach out to Shannon Tweed as feminist studies professor Margot Hunt to lead a small non-military expedition consisting of herself, her undergraduate intern Bunny, and one guide to lead them into the jungle with the aim of making contact with the Piranha Women and offering them relocation to a condo community reservation in Malibu, with the added incentive that Margot may also discover what became of her colleague, Dr. Francine Kurtz, another feminist scholar eventually played by Adrian Barbeau, previously sent to contact the Piranha Women who went missing some time ago. Dr. Kurtz? Internationally famous author of Smart Women, Stupid, Insensitive Men? Yes. That explains her sudden disappearance from the talk show circuit. Oh, and uh, that's Karen Mistel from Return of the Killer Tomatoes as Bunny, by the way. Bunny! Oh no. Bunny! I just found a big kitty! So after wrestling up a guide and settling on Mar as Jim because he's there, they're off into the jungle and yeah, this is what we're doing. This is it. The avocado jungle. Doesn't look like a jungle. The outer regions aren't very overgrown, but foliage gets thicker the deeper you go. There is no avocado jungle or any jungle in San Bernardino, that's the joke. We're very obviously just watching actors walk around the kind of woodsy parts of suburban Southern California and UC Riverside College pretending to be in a slightly less cheap version of the very cheap movie that they're in. We'll head down to some local establishments and see if we can find a mercenary to guide us through the jungle. I've never been to San Bernardino before. Don't worry, Bunny. Are we all right? A hippo, look! A hippo? California? The Palm Springs hippo. It's a lighter version than its African cousin because of the low cholesterol diet. But it's just as deadly. I got it. Charging at the boat. We're gonna Down die. the helm! Don't let it go inside us, Jim! Hard of port! Hard of port! Port, is that left or right? I left! Left! So what we've got here is the rare, dialogue-driven movie spoof, where there are a handful of slapstick gags and some visual humor, but the overwhelming amount of comedy is coming from conversation and character interaction, almost all of which are built around one consistently actually pretty clever setup. Yes, this looks like and has the plot of a cheap, softcore, girls in skimpy costumes in the jungle exploitation movie, but that's actually just the backdrop for the characters to dialogue aggressively about shitty gender politics of the late 80s, largely from the perspective of feminist and or liberal progressive frustration at the macho reassertive feminism got too angry and went too far culture war that had permeated so much media, particularly in comedies of the time. This is going to be a toga party and a beer bust. And for special girls like you, <laughs> we are going to be having a wet t-shirt contest. But all my t-shirts are dry. <laughs> I... You're coming with me. I can go? You'd be safer in the jungle. With Tweed showing a lot more range than she ever really got credit for in her later career as the nominal straight woman, Mar as the asshole punching bag, and Mistal doing deadpan reactions to both of them. Packing out a trail through the underbrush. The trail is clear. You're just packing its branches on the side. Well, yeah, but I just bought the machete. It seemed like a shame not to use it. Anyway, it's good practice when the jungle really gets thick, you know. Sometimes I swing two or three, then it's really light. I think you look really handsome with a machete. Well, 
Thank you, buddy. It really is pretty striking just how much disdain the movie really does have for Mara's character versus how much it's really on the side of Tweed's Margot as the kind of character who's otherwise really only ever be the butt of a joke or maybe a villain in most comedies like this. Even a whole sequence involving a tribe of subservient men called the Donahues is a topical reference to a now mostly forgotten liberal talk show host of the era winds up as an excuse to make Jim look like a dumbass in his attempts to liberate them into proper masculinity. Chick. Broad. Sexy mama. What? Dr. Horan, no! Dr. Horan, no! <laughs> Of course, if you've seen Apocalypse Now or Red Heart of Darkness, you know where this is going when they eventually find the Piranha women. Dr. Kurtz has in fact joined the tribe, set herself up as leader, and is responsible for the recent problems, but with a twist. The future of feminism lies in this temple. Dr. Kurtz, I'm unfamiliar with the academic guidelines at Radcliffe. But I would think any major university would consider warring on the United States and eating prisoners of war a serious breach of ethics. The reactionary male factions are terrified of them. Terrified of the example a nation of strong women might set for the rest of the country. After they succeeded in stopping the ERA, in the wake of a mainstream feminist backlash, they figured it was the perfect time to wipe out the piranha women for good. But the reservations in Malibu... They didn't tell you about were the thousands of subscriptions to Cosmopolitan that were time for delivery when the Piranha women took up residence. Not to mention the team of Mary Kay cosmetic saleswomen who were ready to pounce upon them. They had a secret plan for doing away with the Piranha women. Something far more sinister than an armored division of infantry. Cultural assimilation. Then comes the political orientation. Yeah, and we got Billy Schlafly on standby. Ah. <laughs> Within five years, the piranha women would have been just a bunch of bikini bunnies bouncing around Malibu searching for a good sushi bar. I know a great sushi bar in Malibu. You go down Sunset, turn right at PCH. And you see? And a few more twists on the twist. If you girls are eating only men, you cannot possibly be getting everything you need from the four basic food groups! Thousands of years ago, the piranha women and barracuda women were as one. But we split over ideological differences. What were they? Piranha women believe that men should be slaughtered and eaten with guacamole dip. And you think that's wrong? Yes! We believe they should be eaten with clam dip. That's outline for a book. It's true. I was planning a book. But it was going to be a scholarly work. Oh, hardly, Kurt. You spent too much time in the jungle. The field methodology is sloppy. Your conclusion's shaky. Even Cher Heist couldn't get away with the generalizations you make in your outline. You're no better than the chauvinist who sent us here. Right? I was exploiting the piranha women. You don't know what it's like trying to face David Letterman with a book on male insensitivity. David Letterman. The horror. The horror of that show. The horror. This is all very funny, and now with the benefit of time, downright fascinating as a cultural artifact considering how much has changed and also how much hasn't. The preferred narrative for social satire in pop culture tends to center on big, popular landmarks that either triggered or happened in tandem with nascent but prevailing cultural shifts like Blazing Saddles, so it's really something to see a spoof from this era aiming very much for broad appeal comedy but also hitting back at what were the prevailing and unfortunately very successful social politics of a lot of broad appeal comedy of the time, several years before much of the pop culture discourse turned around and got on the same relative page that this movie is already on. Elvis Presley. Janis Joplin. Pat. Joan of Arc. How about Tammy Baker? Jim Baker, Jerry Fowler, Jimmy Swaggart. Jessica Hunt, Fawn Hall, Donna Wright. Joseph McCarthy. Richard Nixon. Joan Rivers. Joan Rivers? I like Joan Rivers. I think she's funny. Well, I think Nixon's funny. I think you'd like to eat me right now, wouldn't you, Dr. Hunt? Dr. Hunt wouldn't eat Colonel, control yourself. Dr. Hunt is a respected middle-of-the-road feminist. And I'm sure she'll be happy to cooperate with us, especially when she considers how much this university depends upon grants from the Defense Department for its space weaponry program. What do you do? Do you 
set up a joint committee consisting of equal numbers of piranha women and barracuda women. You meet bi-weekly, air any differences that might arise. Hey, let me carry the gun. Just, just to the edge of the jungle. Come on, I, I mean, you drove and everything, but let me carry the gun. You know, all the piranha chicks are watching. This was actually an early writer-director project for J.F. Lawton, who also wrote and directed the other, less interesting attempt at a star vehicle from our Pizza Man, where he's actually the lead and definitely can't carry the project, and also the pretty solid Christopher Lambert ninja movie The Hunted. He also did the original, much darker screenplay that became Pretty Woman, created the TV show VIP, and wrote Blank Man, Under Siege 1 and 2, Chain Reaction, and the Dead or Alive movie, so respect. You handle yourself fairly well. I studied ancient weaponry at Berkeley. Professor Harris? Uh, no, Professor. Johnson. Really? I get Johnson at Stanford. <laughs> And seriously, I know I'm mainly bringing it up here in part to riff on the fact of Mar being in it and this seemingly disposable 35-year-old movie being the most actual worthwhile thing in his filmography, but even setting him cheerfully aside, probably the best reason to revisit this now is how shockingly good Tweed is doing a parody character who can't act like they know they're in a parody of the sort of movie they might otherwise actually make routine. I'm going to do some field research and I need some supplies. Okay, three legal size pads. Ten manila envelopes. Dictaphone recorder and four one hour tapes. I'll need a Bowie knife, first aid kit, 100 feet of nylon mountain climbing rope, breech loading revolver, and holster. A thousand rounds of ammunition. Full metal jacket, hollow point, or Teflon coated. Which do you think would be best for fighting the dangers that lurk inside a hostile jungle environment? I would alternate hollow and Teflon bullets in the chamber. That way, you have maximum stopping power, but still armor-piercing capability. Given that even by 1989 she was mainly famous for being a one-time Playmate of the Year and megastar of low-budget erotic thrillers, it's not so much surprising that she nails the deadpan and has action heroine poise fit for the authentic version of this nonsense than it is that more, better productions didn't recognize those skills and let her use them. I mean, what might have been? The world's most beautiful women. Who will be the new Miss Galaxy? It's time to find out. The underworld's most violent killers and a beauty pageant wired for death. Now the terrorists have run into the one thing they didn't count on. A lady who knows that a woman's place is in your face. Get her! Deactivate the wristbands now. Starring Robert Dalby of Die Hard, Andrew Dice Clay of The Adventures of Ford Fairlane, and Playmate of the Year, Shannon Tweed, like you've never seen her before. No contest. Now it's up to two vice cops. One hard. The hell are you looking at? And one soft. Not much. To blow open the world of high-priced call girls who are being paid in blood. I'm gonna drop you! Hard Vice, starring Sam Jones and Shannon Tweed. Wow, this is a good movie! Anyway, this used to be on Comedy Central a lot because of Mars' involvement, and these days it's very easy to find, so go hunt it down. It's not exactly the scariest cannibalism movie you'll ever see, but it might be one of the funniest. It's also very clever and very ahead of its time. I'm Bob, and that's The Big Picture. Schlocktober continues next week. <laughs>